fire, things like that. And then condition or status is another meaning for that word form. And we think of Christ's position as God. He was one with God, but he chose to identify himself with man and to accept the human condition. And then the next, the last meaning of that Greek word is nature. And this refers to God's being, what he is in himself, and he was the very nature of God. Um, so having said that, just to kind of sum it up, the emphasis in this text um, is on the humility of the word of Christ, right? That's, that is what, um, the reason I went into this is because Jer has often said to us, and, and I totally agree, when we run into hard to understand scripture, we think of the context. Stay with the context. Don't let your mind run off with what you're hearing from a different philosophy. And so the text, and Paul is wanting the Philippian brethren to, to be humble, to learn not to be selfish. And he's using Christ in that. And as God, equal with the Father, Christ accepted a subservient role in the redemption of man. We, we read that in Hebrews. And when Jesus made this decision, he didn't seize, he didn't seize his equality with God, okay, and bring it into the world to appear as God in such a way as to compel us to, to honor and worship him. Um, he came in the role of, of a servant. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, it'd be interesting going along with the point that let each one of you not only look, not look, I'm sorry, let's try that again. Let each mm -hmm. of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Because that's exactly what Christ did. Right. His own interest was, oh, I don't want, like as far as he was just looking out for himself, well, I don't want to leave heaven. I don't, want, I don't want to give up the glories of heaven being here, go down, take a, take the form of a man, die on the cross. Like, why would I do that? Right. But also looking out for the interests of others, that was the only way. And so it goes to your point, uh, leaving aside all of, the, all of the philosophies that people want to grab from that, that's exactly what Christ did. Right, right. And, and we looked up... Um, kind of studied into that thought of he emptied himself. That's uh, in the American standard. And the New King James um, does help us with the context because it says, uh, but made himself of, of no reputation. Um, the word doesn't mean he emptied himself of his deity, not at all. Um, but rather he emptied himself of the display of his deity for, for personal gain. Um, he emptied himself of the glory that he had with the Father. Even when it, when it comes to us, if we are truly humble, we empty ourselves of our pride. Now, Christ didn't have pride. I'm not saying that. Right. But it goes with humility. We have to empty ourselves in order to fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit, going back to Ephesians. Uh, but uh, but we, in order to be humble, you have to do that. He he was humble enough as God to to take our form. Right. Which is hard for people to understand. How could God take our form? Needless to say, he did so many times in the Old Testament, but uh, I guess far as even in Genesis, yeah. uh, uh, even in Genesis, he walked in the garden. Well, how could Adam view him uh, except it be in a form that Adam would recognize. Right. So, uh, that's just the point. So. It, exactly. No, exactly. I thought of, uh, I had a thought there, I just lost it. But I, I thought of an example, I said to Tammy this morning, uh, an example that we can see and understand. Her and I watch uh, a show called Un Undercover Boss, and 
the owner of a company changes his appearance, you know, puts an earring in or hair longer, and disguises what he looks like, and then he goes to his workplace, to the companies that he owns, in order to find out how things are being run and what people think of the, the company. But the people don't know who he is because of his appearance, but he hasn't changed. His his nature hasn't changed. He's still who he is. He's, he's the, the owner of the company. And then it's cued at the end of the show, he removes that disguise. So, so now they know who, who he really is. And then their reaction is, is what makes the, the, the show. But I thought of that the same as Christ. It, if he had come in the form that, um, you know, when he, I thought of when he was transfigured on the, the Mount of Transfiguration, if he came in that form, how would we have received him? I certainly think in a different manner than, than what man did when he came as a servant. And just the thought, too, that he didn't give up his power. Um, he, he gave up the show of the use of them uh, in, in certain instances where we read where he knew others thought. Well, if he gave, an, gave up his, his power as God, how would he have known um, his, our thoughts? But I just thought we'd kind of leave it at that and then, like I said, it's more, you certainly need more time to, we could put that on Jeremy Bliss for a sermon, but um, just to help us with that. And it's interesting, in Paul goes on in chapter 2 to continue with the thought of this is his goal, to, to show how we should be humble. And Christ is our first example um, in verse 7 and 8. And then his example is in verse 17. Um, oh, can't look your fingers now to turn the pages. Uh, Paul says, Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Again, Paul showing his humbleness. He speaks of Timothy in verse 21 and and 22, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ. But you know his proven character, if he's speaking of Timothy, that as a son with his father, he served me in this gospel. And then Epaphroditus in verse 30, um, because for the work of Christ, he came close to death. Remember, that was when he was, was uh, sick in Rome. Uh, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service towards me. So it's just the, the whole thought that Paul's whole aim is, is humbleness and humility. And he knows that as humans we're prone to weakness, to apply humility uh, into our thinking. Because it does, it takes great courage to, to be humble. Um, and the only way we can do it, of course, is to look to Christ, make him, the singleness of our mind needs to be on him. Um, so I'll leave, maybe move on there, no other thoughts. And we'll come up, up to uh, the contents of Philippians. <clears throat> We're going to look at the life of Christ. And... Dave has asked us how do the following passages describe the proper approach to life, to a life in Christ. And our first verse will Philippians 1 and 21. <coughs> we'll start, Sandy, we'll start with you. And uh, you can read this verse for us. Okay, so what do we, 
what's the proper, what's this verse help us in the proper approach um, to a life in Christ? How does this help us understand that? Well, if you, if you think about the life of Christ, it's sort of a thought that just came into my head. When, when Christ lived, he lived the life, like as far as of, of perfect obedience and, and, and submission to the Father and, and, and everything. But when he died, and of course was raised again, he gained back what he had. Uh, some people use this verse to try to teach, well, I'm, just, I'm ready to die. It doesn't matter, like as far as, I'd rather die. Why don't we just, like as far as, that's not what Paul's saying here. To no. live is Christ. We can, do, we can do a lot while we're here, not only living the way Christ wants us to live, but using our example to show others how Christ wants us to live. In the end, yes, dying is gain because we gain, uh, well, as far as we, we, we're going to gain eternal life. Uh, but let's not minimize that Christ had to live on this earth first before he died. Right. And it was his death that brought gain, but his life prepared for his death, if you can get what I'm saying. Right, yeah. And as a, I think maybe it's further in this lesson, but that just brought to my mind, um, uh, he was glorified back to his position in heaven after he had spent his time here upon earth. Um, as, as a, a servant. Um, and it's interesting, too, uh, you just made me think, Chair, that even when Christ seemed to always gave the glory to the Father and to the Holy Spirit, and to us, that's amazing because he was God. And yet in that role, as a servant in that role of humbleness, he didn't seize that, did he? He, he gave it back to the Father, and yet some then want to strip him of, of who he is because he did that, um, which is, uh, is false. So the next verse, um, verse 27, Casey, do you want to read that? Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Okay. What it comes to your mind um, in this verse? I'd like you, before I say anything. What uh, what approach? What do we think of reading this verse then about about our approach? So the first thing uh, might be we consider ourselves never worthy of what we have in Christ. But that does not mean that we shouldn't live in a worthy manner, act in a worthy manner of what we've been given. Right. It's two separate things, we always have to remember that. The, yeah, there has to be the attitude of humility. We don't deserve a single thing that God has given us. Right. But we are unprofitable servants. We'll be doing the things that we're commanded to do. And uh, in, in acting in that manner, that is worthy of what we've been called to. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a good point. Um, we need to reflect, don't we? Um, that's the beginning of it. Um, who we've been called to, Jeff led us to, to see, and by whom. Um, I think some, some versions might have conversation in this uh, verse. Um, that might be a little misleading. It's just not something that comes and goes. Uh, in the, the Greek word means a, a manner of life, which includes everything that, that we do. Um, 
it was uh, it brings to mind chapter 3 and verse 20 uh, because the word spoke of one's relationship to the government uh, and in verse 20 of chapter 3 it reads for our citizenship is in heaven for which we also eagerly wait for the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ um, that should help us then shouldn't it in, in our walk here uh, our actions in life one spirit yeah. one mind stand fast in one spirit one mind that reminds us of Christ too right like as far as Christ always thought about unity of the spirit unity of God and, and so if we're wanting to compare it to Christ stand fast in one spirit and one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel Right. Yeah, yeah, good point. I went along and I thought he he just continually always brings us back to to that that thought, doesn't he? In our next passage, um, chapter two, verse twelve to fourteen. Ken, can you read that one too? Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed. Not as in my presence only, but not much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Okay. Any thoughts on this passage having to do with uh, with the proper approach? What helps us? There's one phrase in here that I kind of centered my thoughts on. Any, any thoughts? Last section says stand Salvation jumped out at me. Salvation and fear and trembling um, is what jumped out at me. Um, salvation is, is present in our minds and our heart, hearts at the moment. And it's also something that we look to in the future. Um, you know, there's, to me, there's a difference there. We, we have the forgiveness of our sins. Um, which is wonderful, but when we Christ appears on that day, and when all our faith becomes sight, then that thought of salvation is, is that isn't something we've experienced yet. Yeah. I think that's where the disconnect comes in on the when people keep can you lose your salvation. And people come along and don't understand, especially in Philippians 2, you get this thought of two salvation. You have been saved from sin. We can't lose, if we become a Christian, we can't lose right. the fact that God forgave our sins. He said he did. Well, that's a point of fact. Uh, he's not going to take that away. Right. But so there's a point in Philippians 2 that salvation is yet in the future. I have not obtained that. I forget that with that chapter 2 or chapter 3. There, like as far as I'm running because I have not obtained that yet. And we, there is a working out of our own salvation. If we have already been saved, verse 12 makes no sense. 
when it comes to why do I have to work out my own salvation if I've already been saved? Uh, and the Philippians make the point there are two salvations. Salvation you've already received when you became a Christian, a salvation that's yet ahead. And it is that salvation that's yet ahead that we have the hope of, but we can throw away that hope right. and then not receive. And and that's where when it comes to once saved, always saved, I think there's a disconnect, not realizing the truth. Right. That's, yeah, that's a good point. That uh, that's why just to continue your thought, that's why we're told then to work it out with, with fear and trembling. Um, because we can uh, lose that. Um, and this expression is only used three times in Paul's writing. Um, once in 1 Corinthians 2 and 3, 2 Corinthians 7 and 15, and Ephesians 6 and 5. Um, and, and really nowhere else in the New Testament he deals with the subject of obedience and, and the state of mind that we must have towards the duties uh, that we are to perform. Uh, like Jeremy said, yes, we, we have the salvation from our sins, but to look forward to that day when Christ comes again in, in judgment, um, you know, we need to work that out. I thought of... Uh, Isaiah 66, I don't know if anybody got it here quick, Isaiah 66 and verse, uh, verse 2, um, for all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord, but on this one will I look, on him who is poor, and of contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. It just kind of impressed me. Um, remember, I think it was Wendy that used to always remind us of that verse. But it went along with Paul's thoughts um, that it will take uh, a humble spirit, which isn't an easy thing for man to to master, but constantly reminding ourselves of Christ, of what we've been offered, by our, when Christ comes again, that salvation, those things motivate us. Oh, okay. Um, so we'll move on then to our I next. Agree. I agree. Oh, sorry. Um, just going back to the, the proper folks part at the beginning where it talks about uh, um, obedience and uh, mentions there that um, we need to just obey always not just when he was there watching them but even when he wasn't there that's the kind of attitude and obedience we need to have too that we're not putting on a show for people um, around us but we need to be conducting ourselves and obeying all the time, whether someone else is around or not. We know that the God sees and knows everything, he knows our hearts. Right. Our minds, but um, just that reminder there, we need to be like proper folks to life, and we need to be obedient all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. God knows our hearts, doesn't he? And he, he looks there. Our, our shown to others would be useless in God's eyes, wouldn't it? If, if it's not in our hearts. Okay, we'll move then to our next verse. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, I think this is it. Yeah. Philippians 3, <coughs> uh, 7 to 11, the first two verses. Uh, Jeff, do you want to get those? 7 and 8? For what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Okay. Uh, 9 through 11. 
challenging and might be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the face of faith, that I might know him and his fellowship of his suffering in confirm to his death in the order that I might attain to the resurrection from the dead. Okay, thank you, Jim. <clears throat> so what comes to mind uh, in this passage that helps us uh, with the proper approach? What the what does Paul bring to mind right off the bat? What did he value um, to get us thinking? What, what did he value before he knew Christ? And we find that, I think, in uh, verses uh, 5 and 6. Where did, where did he place his value? In the, in the law of Moses and his following of the law of Moses. The, the righteousness that could be obtained from the law, which when we understand, we're going to get to that in right. a second. But the, the Jews thought that they could obtain righteousness from the law. And and that's where he's going to get to. So that's the first thing. He, he was looking to the law of Moses right. and his heritage in Abraham. Right, right. And his nationality, who yeah. he was, the nation. Yeah. Um, and we see that today. Um, I see that a lot of times. A nation's tradition is what people lean on. Um, so Paul valued that as advantageous to him or profitable but at the time of his conversion though um, what did he see thinking of that how did he see it found it rubbish but, right uh, like it's a garbage yeah uh, I forget what the King James uses I think it's dung there or something like that King James uses a, a little bit more colorful words, but but I mean as far as uh, he he threw it away, he threw it all away. Right, everything that he stood for, um, he saw it in a different light, didn't he? It wasn't as Jared said, it was useless to him, it was garbage, um, and he saw that there was no value in that as he wanted. To be drawn closer to Christ, as he states in verse seven and eight, um, and he, he broadens the list actually to to uh, anything that would stand between him and Christ, anything that stands between uh, us and Christ. Um, we need to disregard it. We need to examine carefully um, what we place our confidence in. Um, whatever that might be, uh, we're all different. Um, but if it's pulling us away from Christ, then we need to get it out of our lives. Um, and all that's where the thought comes back to humbleness and humility. Um, we can be pretty strong-willed and strong-minded <coughs> at times, and um, Satan can use that power to uh, to pull us away from Christ to have us change our hearts. No, I'm not, not yet. I want to see where you're going yet before I oh, before I jump in. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was I was saying when it comes to humility too, recognizing where our righteousness comes from. Our righteousness doesn't come from the law of Moses. A lot of people want to place their trust in it. Paul said it doesn't come from there. I can't get righteousness. I, that which is through faith, the righteousness which is from God by faith. And and like as far as in who Christ is, what he has done for us, we have to, like as far as obedience, of the, the law of Moses had a fault. And it wasn't God's fault, it was man's fault that he couldn't take care of sin. Christ could take care of sin. 
which is why the law of Moses can't save us, why we need Christ. Christ can deal with sin. We have to obey the law we're under today, but the only reason why even that law, the law of Christ, has any power is because of what Christ did. And if we have faith in what Christ did and obey him like we've already talked about earlier, that's where we can get righteousness from. Not by ourselves, no. but by what Christ did. No. Exactly. Well, maybe on that thought, <coughs> um, the bell is down. We still have three verses in, the, in that section. So maybe um, we'll just end it um, <coughs> with those thoughts. And I think it was of some value to kind of we sidetrack a little bit. Um, but I think it's all of value uh, for us. Uh, to, to those listening, it just reminds us, uh, as Christians, what Jeremy said, of, of what we need to, to do. And for those that aren't, um, haven't obeyed the gospel, um, it kind of enlightens you a little bit to where you should be looking. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to